All right, let's try this again. Ethics of public health. Um, there's a lot that can be said about ethical and moral dimensions of healthcare. Uh, we could teach an entire class on bioethics. Um, we're not going to get to all of it in this lecture for obvious reasons. Um, especially there's a big division between a whole set of questions around uh, clinical issues. So things like for an individual doctor, whether or not it is ethical to provide euthanasia or provide abortions or provide contraception, that sort of thing. And on the other hand, questions of public health, whether we should have universal health care, whether abortions should be or euthanasia should be permitted in general, whether there should be conscience clauses for pharmacists who don't want to distribute contraception, that sort of thing. <clears throat> Pardon me. Especially since you're policy students, you're not doctors, uh, we're going to focus on the second part. We're going to focus on ethical issues that surround public health provision and uh, talk about a number of different dimensions of that, uh, though even so, we're going to, to, give, to barely dip our toes into the kinds of issues that arise. So, what I'd like to talk about in this lecture are really four big issues around ethics and health. The first is, do we have any sort of special right to health or to health care in particular? Or is health or health care just another good that needs to be distributed equitably through society? So the question is basically, uh, is there any special reason to ensure that everyone has health care or is this really just part of ensuring that everyone has money that they can trade for various goods and services? The same way that we might think that there should be redistribution of wealth to some extent, if you're not a libertarian you might think this, without it mattering what people spend it on. If they want to spend it on health care, great. If they want to spend it on big screen TVs, great. Uh, but all of it's really just about redistribution of generic resources. Or is there something special about health where we might want to ensure that people have health or ensure that people have access to health care uh, in a way that's not tied to their generic resources or wealth? Do we want to require that people have certain kinds of access to health or that they spend some of their own resources on it? This is the individual mandate question for the health care reform. Connected to this, of course, then, is the question of how we distribute limited health resources. The bottom line is that there is not enough health resource to go around, whether those things are doctors and doctors' time, medications, uh, testing procedures. There's not enough for us to give everyone everything that they might possibly want in terms of health care. And, of course, there are broader questions about how we trade off how much, how much societal resources we pour into healthcare versus other things that we, that we care about. Uh, you know, one of the, the constant discussions in the U.S. is the portion of the federal budget that Medicaid and Medicare take up. Well, it's a very large proportion. And it means that we're spending money on Medicaid and Medicare that we're not spending somewhere else. We're not spending it on putting money back in taxpayers' pockets. We're not spending it on education. We're not spending it on the military, whatever. So there's questions about how much uh, healthcare resource, how much, how many resources should be devoted to healthcare, and how those resources ought to be distributed among people. And then closely connected to this, sort of chaining down along the line. There's a deep question, especially based on recent research, about whether health can be separated from other concerns of justice. This is Daniel's discussion of uh, health care disparities. It turns out that other kinds of inequities in society drive health care inequities. It turns out that if you are poor almost anywhere, you have worse health care outcomes even if you have access to health care and all this sort of thing. It turns out in America, if you are a black woman, statistically, you have worse maternal child health uh, outcomes. Uh, and this, even if you are a, a wealthy, well-educated black woman, you have worse outcomes. And there are questions about 
why that is, both empirical, both empirical ones about why it is exactly, and normative ones, moral ones about what we ought to do about it. And then finally, all of this really dances around the question of how far the state should be involved in regulation of the body. For many people, the body is the paradigmatic zone of personal control. And lots of questions of public health raise questions about the state piercing the boundaries of the body, sometimes literally piercing the boundaries of the body. Everything from whether the state should be should be able to coerce parents into having vaccines, whether the state should uh, be able to um, have default organ donors, whether it should be able to mandate or withhold certain kinds of health care, uh, whether it should be able to mandate, you know, there's the big issue um, with, uh, with ultrasounds recently for abortion. You know, these are both metaphorical and sometimes quite literal intrusions of the state into the body uh, that come along with these sorts of questions. All right, so let's talk about them. First, is health special? I think the idea that health is somehow special is deeply intuitive. There is a very plausible feeling that if I am prevented from getting health care, this is somehow just different from if I'm prevented from getting a big screen TV or a David Bowie album. Um, healthcare is a need in the way that these things aren't. It's, it's possibly it's more like food uh, than it is like consumer goods. But there's a real question about why should healthcare be special? Uh, and to a certain extent from a policy perspective, we might think that the default should be to not treat it as special. The default should maybe be to say um, that, look, everyone uh, should maybe have more equitable distribution of wealth, but then if you want to spend it on healthcare, spend it on healthcare. If you want to spend it on something else, spend it on something else. And especially a lot of opponents of things like universal healthcare policies have said, look, why should healthcare be different from anything else? If somebody wants a big screen TV, great. If they have money to pay for it, they, they should get it. Um, why should it be any different if somebody wants, um, you know, if somebody wants an MRI or if somebody wants uh, asthma inhaler? Why should that be any different? If they, if they want to and can pay for it, they should get it. So there are at least four different kinds of options for responding to this kind of intuition that, that healthcare seems like it's maybe special, but it's not immediately obvious why it's special or what the implications of any specialness it might have are. So the first one, the obvious one, is just saying, no, it's not special. Uh, it's, it's like any other commodity. Maybe pe commodities in general should be distributed more equitably, but there's no essential difference between making sure that people who want healthcare can get it versus people who want uh, big screen TVs can get them. Basically the same kind of, the same kind of thing. The second option, and this is the one that Wilson suggests, is that to treat health as one of a number of primary goods, uh, and this is in the Rawlsian sense that we've talked about before, primary goods are things that are special because they're good for whatever you want to do with your life. So if you remember, the paradigmatic primary good is wealth. Lots and lots of life plans, various different kinds of life plans, benefit from having more rather than less wealth. And arguably, Rawls argues this, no life plan is harmed by having more rather than less wealth. Uh, you know, if you want to become an ascetic and devote your life to a monastery, having a lot of money doesn't stop you. You can just give your money away. So. What makes primary goods special is both that they're necessary for a wide variety of life plans and by promoting the good distribution of them, the government is not making any decision about what life plans are worthwhile. So for instance, if I, if the government says, look, everyone should have access to a certain amount of artistic training it's saying something about what the good life is. It's saying that the good life involves art. 
in a different way than if it says everyone should have a certain access to a certain amount of wealth, because wealth can be used for any number of different things. Uh, and this satisfies the liberal egalitarian and really the liberal in general's desire to have the government not take a stand on what's worthwhile in life, but just facilitate everybody pursuing their own individual vision of what is worthwhile. So health looks potentially plausibly like a primary good of, of this sort. Just like wealth, um, you, health helps you with pretty much everything. Uh, you might have a life plan like being a couch potato who plays video games. Right? That might be your idea of what the best life is. Being healthy will not harm you. Uh, you know, it doesn't make it any harder for you to be a couch potato. You might become less healthy as a result of being a couch potato. That's a different thing. But there are plenty of life plans that require a certain amount of health. If I want to be a firefighter or a police officer or a soldier or an adventurer or mountain climb, you know, all of these things require a certain degree of physical health to do. So health looks a lot like a primary good. Now, the policy implication of this is that you need to distribute health equitably throughout society. If you're a Rawlsian, you need to distribute it in um, in concordance with the difference principles. You need to distribute health in such a way so that the people who are worst off are as little poorly off as possible. Rawls didn't want to put this on the list because he's concerned about the stuff that we talked about when we talked about Dworkin, about people whose health is bad for natural reasons, not for social reasons. Um, but who also, uh, you, there's nothing that you can do that will bring them up to normal health, uh, especially if you treat health as non-fungible, right? So if health is a primary good that's not directly exchangeable for other kinds of primary goods, uh, you might have a little bit of a problem here, right? You might say, um, I'm going to tread carefully around various kinds of disability rights arguments, so please take this as a good faith comment at least someone who does not have the use of her legs. There are all sorts of ways in which you can make her life better, but you're not going to easily make her the equivalent of someone who has legs. Um, so you've got sorts of problems about incommensurability, you've got problems about how you want to distribute this um, that arise if you just treat health as, uh, as a primary good. You also raise some questions about exactly why you want to treat it as a primary good. And finally, and the thing that, that drives Daniel's concern is that this might, to some extent, not capture the specialness of health enough. To the extent that primary goods are somewhat fungible, this does sound like it might be a situation where you say, okay, well, look, if somebody is less healthy, we just give them more money. You know, so some people in society will be less healthy but have more money. Other people will be more healthy but have less money, and you know we balance, we try to balance it out as best we can. Daniel's intuition, and I think it's it's a plausible one at least. You may not share it, but it's at least a plausible one, is that health is a bit more special than that. If you are not healthy just giving you more money or more of some other kind of primary good is not going to quite balance it properly. So Daniel's argument is that health is not a primary good in that way. Health is necessary for protecting opportunity. So again, uh, Daniel's is a Rawlsian. So the 32nd, I hope, the, the Turbo Rawls review on this is that <clears throat> There's a two-stage process for Rawls on his liberal egalitarian view. First, he says, we would all contract to protect certain basic liberties. And then we would contract, once those are satisfied, we would contract to distribute primary goods in accord with the difference principle. And what this is intended to do is to not make Rawls into a variety of consequentialists. So for instance, you are prevent you are protected from involuntary servitude by the basic rights that are given priority over the difference principle even if it turned out that slavery would be so economically beneficial 
that even the slaves would be better off materially than they would be under the non-slavery regime, right? So they have they have more big screen TVs and David Bowie albums and comfortable couches than they would if there was no slavery. But, you know, they're slaves. They lose their freedom even as they get these material comforts, right? So even if the slavery regime would satisfy the difference principle, it's ruled out by Rawls because civil and political rights are, basic human rights are given priority over any kind of distribution. <laughs> It doesn't matter how large or how equitably you can grow the pie of goods, you can't do it by violating people's rights. And one of the rights that you have, uh, that's sort of one of these sort of bridging concepts for Rawls, is that, this is more than 30 seconds, I know, I'm sorry, is that when you distribute things in society, even aside from the fact that you have to satisfy maximum, when you distribute things in society, you can't just distribute them willy-nilly. You don't distribute them by lot. You don't distribute them by birth. You have to distribute them by um, social role, right? So it's not okay for Paris Hilton to get extra money because she's Paris Hilton. It is okay for doctors to get extra money because they're doctors, right, on a Rawlsian kind of regime. And there needs to be fair equality of opportunity to enter those roles. So what essentially Daniels argues is that providing everyone with access to good health is necessary for protecting fair equality of opportunity. It's necessary to say, you know, if I have asthma, but it can be controlled by medication, that I am provided with my asthma medication such that I can compete fairly with other people who have otherwise similar endowments and talents and, and drive to myself, but who don't have asthma. So for Daniels, it's important that um, health is special because health, it's sort of health itself is only instrumentally special, but it gets a privileged place because it's an important part of protecting opportunity. Um, okay. So it is kind of a, an, uh, a, a consideration of justice. Davian, in a sense, wants to make health even more special. So for, for Daniels, the problem, all right, so if you imagine sort of the hierarchy here, right? For option one, the problem if people don't have access to health is that maybe they have an inequitable share of goods. For option two, the problem with people who don't have access to health is that health is an especially important good and it's not being equitably distributed. For Daniels, it's still a matter of justice but the problem is that if people don't have access to health, they can't compete equitably for the, the, the roles that give you extra goods in society. Davian, I think this captures an intuition that a lot of people have, thinks that if you are not given access to health, this is evil. Um, and it's evil in the sense that, that she picks up from Claudia Card that um, it is an assault on dignity. It is a prevention of allowing you to live a minimally decent life. And the intuition here is that if you are in poor health and you are allowed to remain in poor health when we could fix that, especially if you're in very poor health, right? You're not you have a cold, but you have diabetes, you have asthma, you have cancer, you have, you're paraplegic, you have mental deficiencies or, or whatever. Um, this is preventing you from living a decent life. It's preventing you from living a properly human life. And a system that interferes with human dignity in that way is not just unjust in the sense of inequitable distribution. It's evil. It is assaulting human dignity in a more profound way than mere inequitable distribution does. Now, Davian's wants to be clear, it doesn't mean that the individual people in the system are evil, uh, but the system itself perpetrates evil. And, and this is stronger than just distributing things inequitably. So the intuition she's trying to capture is that it might be unfair, unjust in her words, for me to work hard and be motivated, but not be able to make enough money to buy a big screen TV. Right, that might be unfair, and it's driven. You know, it's capitalism, you know, screws me over, and I can't buy a big screen TV. 
Um, that might be unfair, but it doesn't mean I'm living a life bereft of dignity. Uh, if I am, you know, if I die early because I can't buy health care, um, or if I am forced to live with a debilitating or humiliating illness simply because I can't buy health care. Uh, Davian thinks this is this is a more fundamental assault on my dignity. It's not just that it's unfair that I can't do it, it's that um, it's an assault on my dignity. The same way that like letting me starve might be an assault on my dignity. And in our actual system, uh, part of the reason why Davian thinks this is evil and not just unjust is that even without individual malice, the reality of our system is such that the people who don't have access to the social bases of health and to healthcare are not kind of randomly distributed. They are distributed along line, other lines of oppression in our society. So not to put too fine a point on it, but Davian is basically saying part of what makes it clear that this is evil and not just unjust is uh, you know, it's a spe in, in American society, it's especially women, it's especially black people, it's especially poor people who are being denied access to uh, things that would allow them to be healthy. And this looks a lot more like part of systematic oppression rather than just, oh, you happen to lose out on uh, getting some resources. All right. So, each of the options two through four are different ways of making health special. They may have different policy implications. Some of them may be subtle, some of them may be overt. You know, for Daniels, for instance, <coughs> you're typically not going to be able to balance health against other sorts of things in a different kind of way. Um, for both Daniels and Davian, you, became, you become more invested in having to draw a line between normal health and bad health uh, than for option one or option two, right? For even for option two, more of a primary good is always good. So if, for instance, it becomes possible to, um, do some kind of pharmaceutical or genetic intervention to make people stronger than they would otherwise be, right? Option two will say that's great and we should distribute that extra strongness equitably as much as we can. For Daniels, and Daniels does get into this mostly in sections of the book I didn't have you read, but Daniels does get very invested in this question of what is normal functioning. For Daniels, he's going to say there's a special reason why on a policy level, you should intervene to make sure that I am not crippled. But there's no special reason to intervene to make sure that I can get the strength-enhancing drugs, right? For Daniels, if we had the strength-enhancing drugs, they would be more like big screen TVs, right? If I wanted to spend my money on them and I had the money to spend on them in an equitable system, great. But they don't get the special status that health does, similar for Davian. Um, there's gonna be a line between normal health and bad health that uh, someone who's following option two may not need to draw, right? It may just be a spectrum from, you know, everything we can cure up through everything we can enhance. All right. So however you treat health, whether it's special or not, um, almost all views agree that health is a good thing. And there's a limited amount of health to go around right, in the form of all of the things we can give you that will protect and promote your health. So the question is, how do we distribute it? And I hate to blow your mind, but every system with limited resources needs to distribute it. Every system in some sense is going to ration healthcare and other kinds of bases of health, good nutrition, you know, that sort of thing. Um, whether it's special is gonna affect how you think it ought to be distributed, but Ultimately, you need to have some sort of public policy principle for distributing it, right? Even the market is a public policy principle for distributing it. The market is, it is to say we ration based on ability to pay. You know, other kinds of systems will have something else. Uh, you, but you need some way of distributing it. And one of the special problems that may come up with health is that 
often health may involve comparing across values that are not easily compared or may even be incommensurable. And incommensurable is a fancy philosopher word for uh, non-comparable. So incommensurable values are ones that cannot be reduced to a common standard and then just measured against each other. Utilitarians, for instance, will say there are no such things as incommensurable values, but for health, there are at least things that are trade-offs that might be very, very difficult to compare in any straightforward manner. So think of, for instance, um, headaches versus um, kidney transplants, right? It's good for, if someone has a headache, it's good to get rid of the headache. If someone needs a kidney transplant, it's good to get rid of the, it's good to, not to get rid of the kidney, it's good to, to have the kidney transplant. But if you have limited resources, um, you might have to ask, right? Which do we prefer? Is there some number of headaches that is worth one kidney transplant? Utilitarians are going to say yes, but for most people they're going to say it's at least really hard to see how you make that decision. It's very difficult to see how you can judge when plowing resources into headache prevention is going to be worth giving up on some kidney transplants. Okay, so there are at least three ways in which you might do your rationing. It's probably more than three, but there's at least three. One is through the market. Uh, this is consumer directed. Cato Institute loves consumer directed. Uh, there are a lot of advantages to consumer directed. Uh, it gives you, the individual, the ability to um, make your own decisions about your own health. Uh, in fact, groups like Cato will often complain that the current system we have in the US is not market directed enough. In a purely market system, I wouldn't be stuck having to go to my insurance my insurance company for authorization for a procedure. Uh, you know, I, there wouldn't be all sorts of distortions from, uh, you know, the way that doctors get compensated through the insurance system where I don't bear the full cost, right? If I bore the full cost of MRIs, then I, the individual, in consultation with my doctor, pardon me, could make decisions about whether I need an MRI for something. If I don't bear the full cost, hey, yeah, I'm going to get as many MRIs as I can get. So um, there are a lot of advantages to a market system. It promotes a large degree of sort of individual control and response over and responsibility for healthcare decisions. But it's got some downsides. It may not be fair. Uh, now, of course, proponents of market systems are going to say, well, well, yes, it is fair. That's that's the fair way to do it. And if you're libertarian inclined, you may think of it this way. But there's also a pretty obvious way in which people who don't like pure market systems feel that they're, they're unfair. Um, and this goes back, especially if you think that health is special. It may seem unfair that some poor person can't get a kidney transplant that she needs uh, because some wealthy person is going to pay the doctor to do uh, plastic surgery instead. Now, I'm hoping that's fireworks, but this is the soundtrack of Baltimore. Um, where was I? All right. Um, it may not be fair. There may be people who are not getting... Uh, health support that they desperately need while other people are um, getting things that, that are seem frivolous by comparison in, in, a, in a kind of sense. Now again, liber I don't want to stack the deck here too much. The libertarian is going to say, that is fair. right? The person who made more money, if they want to spend it on frivolity, that's their right. But hopefully at least you can see why people would feel this is unfair. And this may seem especially unfair in the presence of uh, underlying disparities. Right? If our system of who gets money is not fully just, then it's going to seem extra unjust that the people who are unfairly denied some monetary resources are then prevented from getting health resources that they need because they don't have the money that they're being unfairly denied in the first place. Right. So if you don't think that the market fairly rewards everybody uh, currently, then it's going to seem extra unfair. Uh, that then your ability to get health is then tied to the market. Um, 
If you think health is special, this may also exacerbate the unfairness because you might think that health is just not the sort of thing that we should distribute this way, right? So think about something like voting. Most of us don't think that voting is the sort of thing that you should distribute in a market. There's no reason we couldn't have a market, right? There's no reason we couldn't just be able to auction off our votes to the highest bidder and this would let wealthy people even more directly control um, the political system. But many of us think that, that that no, it would not be fair to have a market for votes. Similarly, a lot of people feel like it is not fair to have a market for, uh, for health. Um, there's also some side issues on this. There are some empirical questions people have about markets. There's arguments about whether or not healthcare is an area of market failure because of time pressures and lack of information. Um, but uh, that's more the empirical side than the normative side of the question. Okay, one of the other uh, popular options um, is to have decisions essentially made by technocrats, by some kind of bureaucracy. Uh, so this would be the kind of caricature of socialized medicine, right? Uh, HHS makes decisions about what kinds of procedures will be paid for, how much, you know, uh, how you apply to receive them, who gets them, what the priority lists look like, yada, yada, yada. Um, and this is, in fact, the core way that countries with centrally controlled universal health care, like the UK and like Canada, make their, make their decisions. Um, there's essentially a bureaucratized process. There's not a single panel that is making you know, up or down decisions on whether or not you can get your kidney transplant, but there are panels, uh, for instance, I think it's called NICE in Britain, that make decisions about what kinds of procedures are going to be reimbursed at what rates, um, you know, when you'll be able to do certain kinds of tests, that sort of thing. Um, now, these decisions may be efficient or fair looking in a different kind of way than the market decisions. Um, again, there's going to be some argument about the notion of efficiency involved here, but I think keeping at the intuitively plausible level, um, because they may they may be able to make good decisions, right? There are pushes towards evidence-based medicine. There are obvious senses in which um, there's, there's an obvious sense to the claim, for instance, that in the U.S. people tend to get too many tests. We get tests that are very expensive um, relative to the likelihood that the thing they're testing for is going to happen. There are arguments about whether or not we spend too much at the at the end of life. We plow a huge proportion of healthcare spending in the US into the last few months of people's lives. And it might make sense to spend less on that, you know, to not make certain procedures available or to encourage people and incentivize them to go into hospice care uh, rather than uh, very expensive last ditch efforts that only get you a few you know, a few years of life, or a few months of life, or a few hours of life, even. Um, so, a centralized technocratic system may be able to make good decisions about this um, by being able to sort of look at the whole system synoptically, count everyone's interests equally in a way that a market doesn't, uh, and make decisions. You know, there's a lot of a lot of attractiveness to this. The same way there's a lot of attractiveness to a market for different reasons. Now, um, the problem on this is that. Uh, First of all, these decisions get taken out of individuals' hands. So if you if you care a lot about that, that's a problem. Um, and second of all, even if you're not motivated by a sort of libertarian objection to a, to a techno technocratic uh, approach, it may usurp important value conflicts. So Daniels brings up um, pretty briefly this 1990 decision in Arizona. This is quickly reversed, but in, in 1990 in Arizona, their state health plan decided they were going to undertake essentially a cost-benefit analysis of various kinds of procedures that might be reimbursed by the state health plan. And one of the problems was, or one of the, I don't know if it's a problem, but one of the things that happened was when they ran the numbers and they released the sort of list of priorities, tooth cappings ended up higher on the list than organ transplants. Um, now, you can easily imagine why tooth capping, relative to an organ transplant, tooth capping is dirt cheap. Uh, so even though 
tooth cappings typically don't save your life. They there are there is of course dental work that can be life saving, but you know tooth cappings usually don't save your life. Whereas organ transplants is usually a life or death matter. The the amount of difference in the cost made it look like you know when you run the numbers on things like actuar actuarial value of people's lives made it look like tooth cappings were more efficient. People howled and this thing got repealed, but really what was going on was a version of this kind of headache versus organ transplant problem, uh, or in this case, tooth capping versus organ transplant problem, where the underlying assumption was that we are, of the commission, was that we're going to deal with value conflicts by reducing them all to uh, economic concerns and by using certain standards for how much human life is worth and this sort of thing, and then and then run the numbers. But this usurped the way a lot of people thought about the value conflict. It clearly did not satisfy a lot of people's moral take on the situation. So the technocrats are inevitably going to end up in these kinds of value judgments, and they may arguably not track properly the value judgments of the population, um, or track legitimately the value judgments of the population. There's huge questions about governmental legitimacy in this thing in, in general, but you know, in this particular case. Um, now, of course, ideally, at least in a democracy, you have some control, but the control in this case is very indirect, right? If the secretary of HHS is appointing internal committees to make decisions about the reimbursement rates for various kinds of procedures, Sure, you know, I get to vote for the president, the president appoints the secretary of HHS, but there's not any kind of real direct citizen involvement in this. So the third way of doing it, and this is Daniel's big project that he outlines in chapter four that I give you guys to, to at least sort of skim, is to have a deeply democratic or participatory approach to making decisions about this. So. On this kind of view, it's democratic not just in the sense that it is elected leaders who ultimately hold the reins of power, but that there's a collective decision. <clears throat> Pardon me. There's a collective decision. In that way, it's sort of like the technocratic solution. You know, there's going to be some sort of committee or commission or you know whatever that's going to be making collective decisions about how the healthcare system and how the other parts of the health system are going to operate. But it will involve constant and much more inclusive and widespread citizen participation. So Daniels talks about involving consumers, it needs to be transparent, um, you know, you need to give public justifications, there needs to be lots of discussion and deliberation, uh, and the ideal would be that this would be the sort of thing where a broad sector of stakeholders in health and society would come together to hash out publicly the value, the, the value uh, judgments that are needed. Um, this is kind of a deliberative democracy approach to things. So you still can't escape the need to make value judgments and to make collective value judgments, right? Value judgments that might ultimately conflict with what some people in society want, but the idea is you're going to make them in a much more participatory, much more legitimizing way this way. Now, there are at least uh, there are a few problems with this that come up. One is it's probably going to be massively inefficient. Uh, there's going to be huge, much more administrative overhead compared to either of the other two options, uh, or likely going to be more administrative overhead. It's going to take time to gather all that kind of input. It may lead to, to uneven outcomes. Daniels talks about this a bit, and the basic idea is that if there are fundamental value judgments to be made, and we allow them to be made in some localized sense. Let's say we do this state by state, right? It may turn out that procedure A is covered in Mississippi, but not covered in Maryland. And you know, procedure B is not covered in Mississippi, but is covered in Maryland. So someone in Mississippi who needs procedure B might plausibly say, this isn't fair. <clears throat> why does being born, you know, why does living in Mississippi suddenly mean that I can't get this procedure? And there's not going to be a reason. There's not going to be a reason other than that. Well, the people who participated in the in the decision process in Mississippi decided one way uh, versus the people who, who who lived in Maryland and participated in that process. 
Uh, it's a little bit of a judgment call how bothered you're going to be by that sort of thing. Daniels essentially says, look, that's just how democracy operates. At some fundamental level in democracy, the fact that a decision was made uh, is, is morally relevant. And as long as the decision was made on reasonable grounds, even if reasonable people could disagree about it, uh, it doesn't matter if uh, you know two groups of people look at the same reasons and reasonably come to different conclusions. That doesn't make it unfair. The last thing, and Daniels doesn't worry about this, but I worry about it at least, is that this all sounds pretty nice, at least at least to a certain kind of bleeding heart deliberative Democrat liberal like myself. But in reality, you might worry that it will essentially collapse into technocracy, right? It will not be everyday citizens on the street who get involved in this process. The process will be captured and dominated by industry types, NGO types, governmental agencies. And so essentially, you'll end up with a technocracy, um, even though you're claiming to be participatory. And that's, uh, there might, it might be difficult to craft a policy that does not risk falling into that kind of trap. All right. So, dealt with whether it's special. We've at least, pardon me, we've at least discussed um, different ways you might distribute healthcare goods. And so far, it's been pretty easy for us to fall into, for me to fall into, there's no us, for me to fall into talking about health and healthcare interchangeably. But they're not quite. As Daniels points out, so Daniels had an older book called Just Healthcare, which is a, uh, a, an old classic of the genre. His new book, Just Health, is the new classic of the genre, at least among Rawlsian types. Um, and one of the big shifts was between Just Healthcare and Just Health, Daniels and really everybody came to appreciate more the role that background factors play in your health. It's not just whether or not you can see doctors and get tests and get medicine. It is about other kinds of inequities in society. Daniel's metaphor, um, which I think is a pretty apt one, is that health care is the ambulance waiting at the bottom of the cliff. By the time you see a doctor, you're what they're seeing you for is your body subject to all of the insults um, that your body has been subject to over the time before you walk in that door. And so if in society, if you're poorer, uh, for instance, I mean, poverty, economic class is one of the, is one of the big uh, factors in this. If you're poorer, you probably have less education about how to stay healthy. You probably have less access to healthy food. You probably have a more stressful job, more stressful life just in general. You're probably subject to more violence. You're probably subject to more pollution. And so by the time you walk into the doctor's office, you're going to be sicker than a wealthy person on average. So even if we had a system where healthcare was free and available for everyone, however much they needed, chances are there would be differences in health outcomes between the poorer and the wealthier. And it turns out, this is actually what you see statistically, um, it also turns out that, that while poverty, is a, you know, poverty versus wealth is a big driver, other kinds of societal inequities are big drivers. So again, um, as I mentioned before, if you are a black woman in the US, you are likely to have worse maternal child health outcomes than a white woman, even controlling for things like access to health care, education level, um, you know, general level of wealth and that sort of thing. And even though you live in a society with similar kinds of amenities, right? If you're, if you're a wealthy professional black woman, you might live in the same suburb with the same pollution levels and everything else as the, as the, the wealthy white women, statistically, you're still going to have worse outcomes, um, you know, sort of on, on average. Um, and there are a lot of there are a lot of questions about exactly how this works, but in addition to the various kinds of overt stressors like poor people being exposed to more pollution and often having more stressful jobs, um, may turn out just that injustice is bad for your health. One of the main theories for why black women have worse statistically worse maternal child health outcomes in the U.S. is racism, 
I mean, again, not to be too blunt about it, but the idea is just that, look, living in, if, if you are a racial minority, living in a society that is racist against you is stressful. And it may not manifest on a day-to-day -day basis, but over year, months and years that you, that you live there, it's going to take a toll on your body. And even if you have access to equal health care, it's going to have worse outcomes. Um, so one of the big questions here is, what does this mean for our, for our policy? Daniels and a lot of other folks think that this should drive us into requiring even more egalitarian distribution of wealth, especially, than we would otherwise have uh, just on sort of wealth distribution grounds because of the effects on health, right? So for Daniels, remember, health is part of opportunity. Opportunity for a Rawlsian like him is lexically ordered to be prior to distribution. So while a Rawlsian in general may be willing to accept fairly large wealth inequities, as long as they're to the benefit of the worst off, right? So as long as you satisfy maximin, if that inequity itself, right, if not the absolute level of poverty, but if the, in, if the inequality itself is driving bad health outcomes, then Daniels is going to say, we need to make the inequalities less. We need to, to, to smooth that out. Um, or we need to change other parts of society to change the way that other kinds of things are tied to, um, to poverty or to gender or to class or to race. Um, so this isn't necessarily a problem. It just might be an unexpected implication. It's fairly non rat even something like a universal healthcare system is a fairly non radical tweak to something like a basically market based uh, polity, basically market based system of distribution. Right? It's just saying it's basically just saying we're gonna tax everybody a little bit more and we're gonna provide this one thing across the board. But if you make health special and then you recognize the influence of health disparities, it may turn out that you need to do more than that. You may, to, may need to undertake more radical restructurings of the way your society works. Um, you may need to um, distribute wealth more equitably. You may need to make more things sort of off the table for wealth. Uh, you know, you may need to intervene in non-market-based ways to ensure that, for instance, pollution is, you know, bad things like pollution are more equitably distributed. You may need to spend more of your societal resources on reducing violence in poor areas than you otherwise would. Uh, so there may be more radical implications from recognizing the role that non-healthcare-based things have in health. Um, Probably the most radical is that it does seem to be tied to some extent to the fact of relative inequality. No matter how well off the poorer people in your system, the poorest people in your system are, they seem to get worse health outcomes if there's a big gap between them and the wealthiest. So it may give you an independent reason to lessen that gap, even aside from any other concern. <clears throat> and then, you know, there's the should we go along question, right? Should we follow those implications or should we say, well, it turns out that uh, maybe health is not so important after all? All right. All of this brings us to sort of the deepest, bloggiest questions here, um, which are about social control of the body. Now, remember, I mentioned way back at the beginning of this that especially for folks like Daniels or for Davian who make health special, they're often going to end up very much concerned with a definition of what is normal for humans. Now, Daniels wants to make this straightforward. He wants to combine a normative and an empirical thing and talk about, you know, basically uh, defects in functioning as opposed to just differences in functioning, right? So everybody has differences in functioning. You know, I'm stronger than my wife and she's smarter than me. So, uh, you know, that's just a difference. Neither of us, she's not, you know, defectively weak. Uh, she's not disabled. And I'm not an idiot. Well, okay, well, you can decide that on your on your evaluation forms, right? But I'm not, you know, I'm not, 
I'm I, I'm not uh, mentally disabled. I'm just not as smart, right? Those are just variations. So, but he wants to tie this with a pathology and then one that interferes with with opportunity. Um, and the problem for this is basically the problem for this that, that this this needs to answer is basically that. On the one hand, there are things that seem quite clearly to be matters of normal functioning versus defective functioning. If I have cancer, you want to cure my cancer if you can. If I have asthma, you want to treat my asthma if you can. On the other hand, there are things that uh, clearly don't fall, or at least, I don't know about clearly, but for most people, they seem to not fall into this, right? If I don't have you know, giant Lou Ferrigno muscles, you probably are not obligated to make steroids available to me so that I can get giant Lou Ferrigno muscles, right? If there's some drug that in that would make me super smart, uh, you're probably, the state is probably not required to make that available to me. So things that are, in, that are, that are enhancements um, to normal human functioning seem to not be special in the way that potentially other kinds of health are special. But there's a big, big, gray, mushy middle area. Um, for instance, what about fertility treatments? There's a pretty intuitive sense in which being able to have children, biological children, is a normal human functioning. You know, and if someone is sterile, that seems like a defect. But is it normal in the sense that we need to protect, right? I'm not going to die if I'm sterile. I'm just not going to be able to have children. Um, certain kinds of cosmetic surgery might fall into this, right? Uh, if I want to get breast augmentation just because... I want to, you know, I want to look hot. Uh, please, just don't, don't get the mental image. Just run with this, right? Then that might seem like okay, that's an enhancement, right? We shouldn't pay for that. But what if I want to get breast reconstru reconstruction because I've had uh, a double mastectomy, right? Is that cosmetic or not? You know, if you remember all the way back to Rawls talks about the social bases of um, of respect. Right? If people are going to shun me because I have some co because I have some quote unquote cosmetic defect, does that elevate it? Right? What if I have an unsightly birthmark on my face? Um, what if I'm obese? Right? There's there's arguments in in pop culture now about sort of obesity versus fat acceptance. If I'm obese, um, is getting me stomach stapling surgery, is that a way of restoring me to normal human functioning, or is that um, an enhancement, something that, that shouldn't have this kind of special status. What about, on the flip side, you know, we talked about sterility, but what on the flip side, something like access to contraception, right? On the one hand, you could see making an argument that, you know, normal human functioning for fertile people is being able to reproduce. So contraception can't possibly give you normal human functioning. But on the other end, what if somebody says, yeah, no, 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 normal human functioning is being able to control whether you reproduce. Um, so providing contraception, providing possibly even abortions is an important part of making someone normal. Um, you know, these kinds of questions, I think, are especially gray in our current world where, you know, everything's constructed. We're not noble savages in the Rousseauian sense living in the wilderness. So there's all sorts of things, even about our physical bodies, that have to do with the way we interface with a constructed social, technological, physical environment. And so the question of what is to be a normal human being in a environment that is in deep ways fundamentally non-natural is kind of a tough one, as it turns out. So one of the things you might be concerned about um, whether you're Foucault or whether you're with the Cato Institute, and uh, I, I'll admit, um, I, I'm mildly amused by being able to put Foucault and the Cato Institute at least sort of on the same side of this issue, is can we have state support for health without 
allowing the state to define what the normal body is. Uh, this is something that the Slayton Article 2 brings up, right? Once you have state supported health care, you open the door for the state deciding what kinds of health care is not just sort of technically appropriate, right? It's not just the value decisions about how you trade off organ transplants and tooth cappings. It's the value decisions about what you consider valuable, right? If abortion is a matter of the, per the purely private market, then you have a fairly plausible, at least on the liberal kind of model argument to say, it's an individual decision. You don't want an abortion, don't have one. If other people are having abortions, no skin off your nose. But if we have public provision of health care services, where your abortion would be paid for by my tax dollars, well, suddenly this looks like a much more plausibly public decision. Suddenly it looks a lot more plausible that you should get to decide whether or not people are allowed to have abortions, um, for better or worse. And one of the questions, this is really the Foucauldian question, one of the questions is, when you start getting into this, one of the questions is, whose purposes does the normal body serve? Remember, normality is defined in part biologically, but biology is not, you know, biology is, is about proper functioning to a large extent, right? So it comes back to this issue of what is the proper function. Normality on top of this is defined in large part about what it takes to be a normal person in the social setting that you're in. Um, and this raises some deep questions about whose purposes does the social setting serve, right? You know, Foucault is a post-Marxist, so the story he basically tells is that, look, public health is not about some kind of abstract, neutral protection of humanity. Public health starts out as um, the rich being worried that the poor carry diseases and wanting the government to enforce class divisions so that you don't have pathogens crossing that boundary and culminates in a kind of public health that is there to protect and preserve a labor force of a certain form. Um, you know, so public health, you know, when you start thinking about um, things like contraception, right, you might ask, if you're a Foucauldian, you might ask, you know, whose purposes does allowing certain kinds of contraception and not other kinds of reproductive control serve, right? Um, let's get, hold that thought. On a more, uh, you know, more mundane and, and concrete and sort of policy-oriented level, think about some things on which there are controversies, right? It's harder to see the things that we do now that might look horrible to people 50 years from now. But think back to things like prescribing Valium to women in the 1950s. Valium was fairly widely prescribed. Um, I hope all of you are at least vaguely familiar with this, right? But, you know, Valium basically, it's a sedative. It kind of chills you out. Um, it was prescribed for various kinds of nervous disorders, but a lot of people looking back now at the prescription of Valium basically say, um, yeah, Valium was basically prescribed in the 1950s to women who didn't want to be 1950s housewives. It was a medical intervention that was there to preserve a certain socio-political concept of the normal that is one that, you know, we may not want to endorse. Um, and we may not want to use state power to endorse. Nowadays, you can think about things like uh, arguments over overprescription or overdiagnosis of ADHD, of attention deficit disorders in children. You know, ADHD is a genuine thing, right? Attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is a genuine thing. It happens. But the arguments over overdiagnosis involve a lot of people essentially saying, look, there are some people, who are, there are some kids who are getting this because they actually have ADHD, right? There are other kids who are getting this because they're kids, right? Because our social system wants children to sit still and listen and obey in environments like schools. And that may not be what children naturally do, right? It might be normal 
in our system. And it's a genuine requirement, right? If you want to go on to get a job, be part of the labor force, um, you know, you need to be pretty good at listening and sitting still and, and obeying. Um, but, you know, it's, there are a lot of people who, who, to whom that looks somewhat sinister. And it's probably, it's probably fairly straightforward that this is actually a value judgment involved. It's not just looking neutrally at what is natural or normal for human beings. It's looking at what is normal for human beings within a particular state-sanctioned, socially sanctioned structure uh, that defines the normal. And this socially sanctioned structure can reach pretty deeply into the body. Again, if you, if you like a lot of people, feel that the body is the paradigmatic site of personal control and personal freedom, this at least should raise some questions, right? It should raise some questions about whether or not we really want the state and political power reaching down to that level, in some cases literally piercing the, 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 the external barrier of the body. Now, the flip side of this is that we shouldn't take it to be straightforward that removing decisions about the body from state control automatically makes us freer, right? Even for Foucault, uh, the advent of labor force medicine is not just about the state controlling things, right? It's largely about the state strategically controlling some things, strategically ceding control to the, to the market and to corporations and allowing the market to create things that it needs, right? To create its own labor force. The state is only one part of the equation. Um, so there's actually, it's a difficult question for a lot of things. So to come back to this issue of abortion, right? Um, in the US currently, as probably, hope, hopefully, hopefully you guys learned this in school, right? So in the US currently, uh, Abortion is considered a constitutionally protected right um, on the grounds of privacy doctrine. And this goes back to Griswold v. Connecticut, which was the decision that Roe v. Wade relied very heavily on. The idea being that we have a right to privacy um, that's protected by the Constitution. We essentially have a zone of personal control uh, that is shielded from government intervention. And importantly for the story about abortion, it's not just the body that's the zone of control. It has to do with the bedroom and the family home being the zone of personal control, right? That's part of part of what hives the government out of my wife's abortion decisions is not just the limits of her skin, but the walls of our of our family home. Um, and one of the concerns that people have raised, there are a number of feminists who do not like the fact, um, Catherine McKinnon is one of them as far as I know, who do not like the fact that, uh, I am another one of them, I'll put my cards on the table, uh, who do not like the fact that abortion is a considered a privacy right. Because shielding the decision from government intervention doesn't just mean that you're free. It potentially allows more room for the operation of other kinds of social forces. So, for instance, there's a thing in the U.S. called the Hyde Amendment. Um, it's been passed every year since. Mm -hmm, um, that prevents the use of federal funds for abortions. Now, in a privacy doctrine, this seems pretty strict. This seems pretty plausible and pretty reasonable. Um, the government can't tell you you can't have abortions. But the government can say, you can't spend government money on this because this comes from taxpayers, including taxpayers who are, who are against abortion. But what it means that is that if you are poor and on Medicaid, um, well, you know, find the money somewhere else because you can't have an abortion on Medicaid. Uh, if you are a member of the military and you're on military health care, hope you can find the money somewhere else if you want an abortion uh, because you're not allowed to get it on military health care money. Now, this keeps the government out, but it exposes women to market forces in spades, right? Suddenly, whether or not you can exercise a certain kind of control over your reproductive functions depends on where you sit in the market. It depends on whether you're poor or whether you work for the government. Um, so 
at least for the federal government. So this allows, for instance, women who are on the uh, who get the short end of the stick economically to arguably be less free uh, because the government is kept out of the decision. Other sorts of factors can come into this too. If, for instance, you, like many people, if you're, a, if you're a woman in the U.S., there's still a decent chance that you will not have your own career and your own health insurance. Um, this can potentially make you dependent on uh, your husband's feelings about uh, whether or not you should have an abortion uh, in a way that goes beyond even issues about domestic violence and this sort of thing. So merely keeping the government out of a decision doesn't keep all loci of power out of a decision. Again, this just comes back to one of these things uh, where I'm, where I'm going to have to give you the very unsatisfying conclusion that it's a difficult question how you want to design this. Recognizing that government or social support for health is deeply intertwined with government and social definition of the normal human body uh, is really just a signpost to an extremely tangled and difficult problem uh, rather than a way of saying here's what the, here's what the answer should be. It turns out that neither just saying keep the government out nor just saying the government should help everybody get what they need is a way of solving this kind of problem. It's fundamentally a value judgment about where you think state control, democratic state control, should extend, and uh, what kind, you know, how you want to navigate that tension. All right, let's bring this home for now, and let's hope the encoding takes this time. Few main ideas I'd like you to walk away with. There's a huge amount we could talk about here, and I'm looking forward to what comes up in class. But a few things that should be signposts for your thinking about health policy. One is, most people have at least some intuition that health is special, uh, but it bears some thinking about what makes it special and what exactly the policy implications of its specialness are. The second is, alas, every system needs to ration the resources for health in some way. Every system, whether it is complete laissez-faire market or total totalitarian socialized medicine needs some kind of procedure for deciding on who gets what in terms of both direct health care and the social bases of, of health. And the only real the only real question is not whether you're going to have some kind of some kind of rationing and, uh, and control, but what kind of rationing and control and who that's going to privilege. Is it going to privilege corporate understanding of the normal body? Is it going to privilege government understanding of the normal body or what? And public support for health is tied up deeply with public interest in the body. It is literally the creation of a body politic. All of the techniques of power and the involvement of collective decision making um, in decisions about, about health. It really highlights the very fundamental ways in which we, even in our bare physical existence, are not completely separate either morally or practically, from the society, from the polity. All right.